ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to welcome you all and our Secretary General, Dr. Torre, to your keynote speaker for this evening. Cisco's Executive Vice President for Industry Solutions and Chief Globalization Officer, Wim Elfrink. Thank you. A warm welcome. And thank you for joining us at the end, probably of a busy day, a lot of interactions. Um, and then you have a topic like this, the role of technology in enabling sustainable growth. Um, I'll keep it relatively light. Um, I'm not going deep in technology, don't worry about that. Because it's not about what technology is, it is what technology can enable and how it can enable sustainable growth. If you think about uh, the topics that I will cover in uh, probably uh, around 40 minutes of uh, one-way communication, um, what type of problems do we want to solve? And what are the pressing problems and the challenges from a social, economic, and environmental point of view? Then secondly, what is the role that technology can play? Um, and it's, uh, I've called it in the past oftenly uh, the fourth utility, gas, water, electricity, and people told me, don't do that, it's an essential infrastructure. So I should like to have your feedback also later, and that can you see technology as an essential infrastructure? And what can it enable, and how can it uh, stimulate, like I said, sustainable growth? And then last but not least, uh, I'll show you a lot of uh, use cases, best practices, and then again, in our dialogue, um, why do some things scale and others don't? How can we accelerate the adaptation of technology as a key enabler? So let, let's talk about those challenges, the global challenges. And at number one, um, social demographics, a topic that I think is still very underestimated. And the 21st century is going through a demographic shift that we have never seen in history before. Secondly, it's all about GDP shift. It's a given now that, and you know, I'm always embarrassed to say that emerging markets are outgrowing developed markets. So shall we stop saying emerging markets? Shall we call it the new power economies? Shall we call it the new growth markets? But I think that, that developing markets is an, a wrong way to call it. And then thirdly, um, the environment, and that one of the most pressing challenges for the 21st century, um, whether we call it uh, carbon emission, um, if we do nothing and we go on in the way we do today, by 2030, we will have an energy consumption that increases by 40%. How, how can we change these trends and how can we accept them? And so first, if we look at demographic shifts, um, part of the world is aging, specifically the US, Part of the world is aging and shrinking, Europe, China, and then last but not least, we have the Middle East, Africa, and India, where we still see hyper growth. Um, if, we, if we look at the numbers, uh, that, that what these numbers give you um, is the percentage of people of 65 years and older. Um, I've called out here the world, as you can see, we're growing from seven to almost 15%. So the world is getting older and older. Um, China, that a lot of people overlook that, but the, the China is aging quickly. And then last but not least, the Netherlands. And now you probably wonder why the Netherlands? It's my accent, you know, I'm Dutch. And, and you know, I'm going to be one of those folks from 65 and older. Um, also, and the point I tried to make is that uh, you know, I'm, I'm Chief Globalization Officer. Very interesting title, but still, I'm very Dutch. Every four years, there is an event on the world, and suddenly I go in my orange outfit, I sit in front of the television or I go live. It's the World Championship Soccer. And the point I try to make with that is that we are tribal. You know, as human beings, we belong to something, and, and that, that is probably a big imperative in accepting new technologies and communities. I'll, I'll come back to that. Huh? But so, you know now, I'm Dutch, and I will refer a couple of times to it. Huh? But the aging population, 
Um, if you think about it, uh, I was uh, born in Rotterdam and later moved to a small city uh, close to the coast, uh, Noordwijk. Um, when I went to school, we had six schools. Today, we have no schools anymore. There are not a lot of young people anymore. Um, and so the demographics of countries and the economic cycles are changing faster than people experience. So aging. Aging is shrinking. And th shrinking, if you look at Europe, at the net reduction in population in the next uh, coming decades is 5%. Germany added uh, what we call an, an, a miracle from an economic spirit. And Germany is one of the few countries who has maintained manufacturing in the country. And now uh, they start facing that they can't source it. But because the population is aging, the population is shrinking. Russia, as an example, 20% reduction. You need a 2% productivity improvement per year to just maintain standard of life. And now we go to the hyper-growth part of the world. The world is growing from 7 billion to 9 billion people. And take a country like Nigeria, that almost the same population as the US today in the next coming decades. Saudi Arabia, India. And the real, I think, essential is that these countries are still getting younger. And countries that get younger, young people are more innovative, uh, are more dynamic, are more change agents. So also from an, an innovation point of view, uh, you can expect that the shift from an innovation point of view and where it happens around the world is shifting. It has shifted from Europe to the US. It's shifting to this side of the world. But the consequences of these demographic shifts, um, that in, in a nutshell, in emerging countries, the new power economies, I'm going to stick to that, uh, is that 700 million people are going to be urbanized. Can you imagine 700 million people? That's 180,000 a day. That are two Tokyos a year. And people who move from rural areas to an urbanization, to an urban, to a city. And that will mean that, that we have a need of 100 cities and more um, in the next decade. 100 cities. And there will be a lot of greenfield. That will be new innovation. And we can do it first time right. 50% of that construction is going to take place in Asia. So guess what? And where will be the center of innovation and the center of knowledge that will be on this part of the world? And that's why we have um, our uh, globalization practice as a business consultancy for urbanization here in Dubai. And uh, that's not in Silicon Valley, not in the US, not in Europe. And we are investing that global function to be operated out of Dubai here. 50% um, um, of the population, and uh, that if you think about India, if you think about Africa in general, has not yet access to water, electricity, education, or healthcare. Three billion people is the forecast are going to be connected. And for the first time in history, uh, you will see that, that, that people in small villages will have access to information before they have access to the normal utilities like water and electricity. And that will generate new business models and create innovation and new cycles that we haven't seen before. And the most, used, the most frequent used uh, download of application of the Apple Store in these rural areas, because the majority has a cell phone, is just the light. And because in the evening, you can use your phone as a lamp. You already see that in, in some parts of India, in rural areas, um, people who didn't have the, the, the opportunity to have an education can't read or write. They do video surveillance. And they do video surveillance for companies, retail companies, specifically in Europe and the US. And so you start seeing new economic cycles going up that we haven't seen before. There will be a shortage of 4 million teachers in a country with high unemployment. And India alone will need, for safety and security, more than 600,000 police officers to secure the cities and the city dwellers. On the other side, if you look at the developed world, 
And there are stimulus packages, and there is a lot of revitalization of cities going on. So only 3% of buildings in the developed world are LEED certified. 70% of worldwide energy is consumed in the majority of cities. And 70% in these cities is consumed by buildings, by enterprise companies. If you think about an easy hit to reduce energy consumption, think about buildings who have an utilization of 40%. And then why not get more directives on LEED certification and do it first time right? And that get these global policies implemented. Life extension, assisted living, um, in the US, 8% unemployment, 7.8, who cares? But around that number, and the shortage of nurses, to more than 200,000, growing to 300,000. So the point I try to make is that on one hand, we have high unemployment, we have demographic shifts, and we have a mismatch. We have a total mismatch around the world at this moment. And the estimation is that we have 10 million jobs open in manufacturing. And because in the Western world, we, we can talk about we will get manufacturing back, but you know, we, we wear leather shoes. We don't go back in factories. And perhaps in, in, in the high end, in, in the new technologies, a bit basic production it will start shifting from China to the Philippines to Vietnam to Indonesia to India. It will constantly move around. But the mismatch of skill sets, demand, and supply from an, a human inventory point of view is something we have to address. And technology can play a key role. A million teachers in the US will retire at the baby boomers, my type of generation. And then last but not least, crime rates are going up rapidly. And so on one hand, the power economies have needs and have mismatches but the same applies to the developed world. And so we have a common type of challenges. It's not that divided as you perhaps initially think. So here's my statement. How can we, and I'll have a little bit about technology, but how can we position technology? Are we seeing the perfect storm? Are there some things coming together now that I would say that the accessibility and the absorption of technology will be accelerated? I was in an, uh, a policy session earlier this afternoon, and I said, you know, I asked, and I didn't get a real answer, why can we phone worldwide now with a cell phone? Why do we have a standard? What, what happened? What, what, what was that compelling event and that suddenly we have global open standards? And we have to wonder, can, is there a moment now that we see in technology coming together that we'll have that again? And so, so we talk about devices. We talk about what we call the internet of everything. So not the internet for ICT and communication. All devices are going to be connected. And that will create unprecedented opportunities. Um, and we are currently at an inflection point and that we have more devices connected than that we have people on the earth. And, and it, it will rapidly increase now, and the numbers are around 50 billion by 2020. It's an industry in itself, according uh, to IDC. It will be in a 1.5 trillion device market, and it will be on top of that a 2 trillion services market. And so an enormous, I would say, new type of development from an economic uh, perspective. Um, we call it machine to machine. And a lot of people always say, that's a bit, but, but what do you mean with machine to machine? Let me give you an example. This is not even machine to machine. This is application to application. And it happened to me this morning. Um, you know, I had my alarm clock at nine minutes past five because I had a conference call at six o'clock. And that nowadays you're, you're not safe anywhere. You can't even go to a to conference without having to work in conference calls or telepresent sessions. So what happened, you know, took my shower, dressed up, had ordered the breakfast, six o'clock, I logged in, and guess what? My call was canceled. Could have slept an hour longer. That's so frustration. Machine to machine, application to application, intelligent, and I give it three years, give it five years. If somebody cancels a call in your scheduler, it should go to your alarm clock, and your alarm clock should go an hour out. 
And that, 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 that are real benefits, you agree? Uh, but that, that, that is what's going to happen with machine to machine and application to application. Everything that will be connected will drive productivity improvement, will create new value, and can be green and secure. So from a technology point of view, and I'm not going detail here, but uh, that we see inflection points. And that from, from an infrastructure point of view, technology, uh, Cisco, routers, switches, and we went uh, from, from what we call circuit to packet switching, and we've gone through a lot of transition points, and we now go from voice and data to video. We call video the new voice, and, and, and guess what? In five, ten years, uh, that you will only make voice call, and voice will be pervasive in everything you do. Um, we, we talk about smart grid, uh, everything connected uh, from an energy management point of view. Connected industries, manufacturing, all devices being connected. And then last but not least, not independent networks, but what we call the internet of everything, compiled over one network. On top of that, and that could be that, that, that accelerator, and we see also market transactions. We see cloud virtualization, mobility is going to play a key role. Uh, cell phones, uh, smartphones, collaboration, video, and then big data moving to open data, and open data will create an explosion of applications. So all these things coming together, normally we say in the next three years, mostly uh, that we are too optimistic over the next three years, and we are too pessimistic over the next 10 years. Uh, but in the next decade, let me say it like that, uh, these things are going to come together and will create unprecedented opportunities. And if people say, I, I don't think so, if you see what has happened with telephony, um, eight years ago, for the people, the technologists under us, um, we had no penetration of IP phones. Today, um, and we have more than 95% um, business enterprise phones over IP, and it has given a 50% reduction in cost. So productivity improvement, additional value, new standards that are emerging. Data, you know, and I've heard a lot about it, and you probably too, about the, the explosion of data. A couple of numbers. And at, at this moment, a typical US household with three children, with, you know, Facebook and applications generate more traffic over the internet than the entire internet in 2008. And it will go to what we call zettabyte, and I don't even know what it is, but a zettabyte of data, um, if you put it as books on top of it, it's from here to Pluto 20 times. It's 73 billion miles, not even kilometers, and miles of, of data. And it, it, it goes beyond your imagination. Uh, but who cares about data? It's about what you do with the data. How do you make intelligent decisions? How can you use it in your daily life to be more predictable? And data in itself has no relevance. Every second, at one million minutes of video content will cross the globe. And so an explosion of data and access to data. So let, let, let me go to a couple of examples and, and use cases. And this is one of our favorite examples. It's an uh, urbanization. And that urbanization, access to healthcare, education, and country transformation are going to be my topics for use cases. It's a city in Korea, Incheon. It's being built as a greenfield city. It's reclaimed land. It's actually where uh, General MacArthur landed um, in 1953. Uh, the city is built by Gale International, an American company. And when they start building it, they had sustainability in mind. And so there is an, a waste management system underground. We also learned that um, if the distance between apartments, between shops, is not longer than a 12 and a half minute walk, people walk and they don't take the car. And so that from a sustainability point of view, to reduce traffic, to have public transportation, waste management system, and it, it is really built as one of the most sustainable cities in the world. And there is a bridge, you, you can see that in the shadow, that goes to, to the airport, so it's going to be an aerotropolis. And because with, with planes, 
flying further, bigger distances. And you also see traffic flows changing, uh, logistic centers. You know, when I was a kid in Rotterdam and, and my father took me to the harbor, and uh, that he predicted uh, that when, he always said it to me, kids, when you have my age, this harbor will be in the sea. It will not be in the city anymore. I will tell my kids, probably Rotterdam in 50 years have no harbor anymore. It will potentially be in Jeddah, could be here in Dubai, because water is rising, and you will get new flows around the world of shipments. There will be in the railroads, and somewhere between Saudi and Germany. And these logistical flows are changing with a rapid change. But Eritropolis, and it's good to create jobs. Look, look at here, Dubai, and with Emirates. It's not just the passengers, it's also the cargo. It creates hundreds of thousands of jobs. Eritropolises. So we added technology in the city, and so underground, all the utilities are connected. And, and that, that, that gives an, an opportunity, together with cloud services and everything connected, and that you can start thinking about a services economy. And we are used that you get in your apartment, in your house, you get gas, water, and electricity. In the future, uh, you will get a new essential infrastructure, ICT. Nowadays, you go to a shop and uh, that you install wireless and you get a set-top box and you get a disc. You buy devices. Five, ten years from now, it will be built in. And you just provision services. And you go to your service provider. And that who will provide services to you that goes far beyond triple play for his data and video. And it, it will be a whole set of, of, of new data. And you know, those two pictures, the, the, the left side, also for you, yes, the left side. And this is an, a command center in Rio de Janeiro. And it's one of the most sophisticated ones where all utilities come together over one infrastructure. And you know, it, 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 it gives an opportunity to do scenario planning. And because the data is real time. And I was on the ground when uh, a storm and a typhoon hit Rio. And, and then, you know, they, they have these what-if type of scenarios, these playbooks that they can say, let's close these roads, let these children go home earlier from school, um, and that reroute traffic, do this, do that, police escorts. It, it, it's a commando center uh, that, that's really activated by real data. On the other side, the citizens uh, will get access to all that data, um, either via a cell phone, and a tablet, or in the house via a television set, a telepresence. Open data uh, will become usable, and providers will start building apps around it. And, and what you will see in these cities, uh, there will be harmony between an economic cycle, attracting investors, and have a good business, social aspects, it are nice cities to live in, and environmental. And often we focus just on one element, and you know, what if you live in a green city and you have no job? Or what if you have a job and the city is totally polluted? Or there is a an, an high crime rate? It's that balance between the three that can be different and on different levels by different urban cities. So it's also that data and information is useless unless you can do something with it. And so we basically, we, we talk about data, we talk about information, we talk about knowledge, but the top is wisdom. And that if you have all that data, you can do scenario planning. What if? What if, if a thunderstorm hits? What if, if there is a natural disaster? What if, if there is an, a big traffic accident somewhere on the road? What if? And scenario building is the future of what big data will enable you. For citizens, and you know, don't try to read this, but this is our portfolio. We have identified more than 200 services that you can use. Services to a better quality of life. And because that's another thing that often is overlooked. Why did people move to cities? How did urbanization start? Urbanization basically started because of security. That people wanted to be safe, and the security was a physical wall around the city. 
And then you got specialization and people started to do jobs and you got trades. And then when people got some prosperity, they wanted to go to a restaurant, nowadays to music, to a concert, to a movie. And that quality of life is increasing. And so these are all services that will become available. And so this, this is a menu that, that I choose for myself. If I would live in the city of Incheon, this would be my menu. You know, I would do healthcare monitoring from home. 80% of doctor's calls don't need physical interaction. Why should you jump in the car and drive to a doctor? More and more equipment, and the internet of everything, all devices will be connected. There will be price points for diagnostic equipment that you can have at home. So you can basically have blood, stool, urine from home, and only at that when you need therapy, you go to a doctor. Uh, virtual healthcare, and you've seen probably a lot of use cases, is real and is happening. And you know, a very down-to-earth, and you know, that some of my colleagues hate it if I give that example, uh, but I would pay $5 a month uh, we all go to a place in the morning and I would get a nutrition advice for the day based upon what I ate, drank, or did last night. And that these are services that are going to be available and are great opportunities for service providers uh, to extend their reach of services and to go in new businesses. And because voice is going to be video, it's not about minutes anymore, it's about distance. It's about data, it's about services, and how can you monetize that? And so another example I have is, is, is parking services. Did you know that an average citizen in Paris, an average citizen in Paris, is spending four years of their life finding a parking place? Four years of your life. And wouldn't it be a great service that via your GPS, you come off the highway, you drive home, and you see where you have free parking places? And then you park at your home and you can have an, uh, you know, basically a blue, silver, or gold type of packet. And the elevator will be there. And you have a privileged place. And that, um, access to security services. And that, that being away from home, assisted living, health. And so a whole new set of services. And so the point I try to make is that it's not about technology anymore. And technology will be an essential infrastructure. We will consume services. We don't buy equipment. Everything as a service. One of those inflection points coming all together is also the growth of software applications. Who would have predicted three or four years ago had the tablet with an explosion of apps? And that, um, if, if you think about it, that we have more than a million applications now and I don't dare to give a prediction. Uh, but it, it will explode. And if you compare it, at uh, Nowadays, every week, we see 100 new movies coming out, and 250 books are released worldwide, and 15,000 apps already. And an average app is downloaded 15 times, 18 billion downloads a year today. So open data becoming available, application providers start building services and start building apps. And that's a new revolution together with the internet of everything that could be an inflection point, an acceleration of adaptation of services. So is it all greenfield? That we talk about greenfield, we talk about brownfield. I heard it in the session this afternoon on smart cities. No, and there are fantastic use cases, Amsterdam, London, Rio. I, I picked here Barcelona, where via visionary management that adaptation already has started. The district 22 um, at Barcelona, um, that, that they have created innovation clusters around themes, they have provided infrastructure, and they have documented that over the last 10 years, four and a half thousand new companies are being established. They created 150,000 jobs and counting. Uh, and it's good for the environment, it's green, less energy usage, a fantastic use case that I would urge you to look at. And that, that innovation around clusters. And that we already see nowadays entire cities being built around a theme. Another use case um, is um, open data. And this is an example uh, of Washington um, where they made what they call the 311 data available for application developers. At 311 are irritations of citizens about services. 
And you know, with a budget of $50,000, they generated more than two and a half million in a couple of weeks. So if we said in the past that George Orwell, Big, Water will, Big Brother will watch you, it's going to be the other way around. The citizens will watch Big Brother. And nowadays that via Twitter, you know earlier where so it's happening something and then that you get the official information. And so all these type of things are coming together and at that whole explosion of big data to open data, the public sector is going to be an, a model for innovation. So the benefits, the benefits, because that's what it's all about. And was that one of the reasons that the cell phone was accepted as a global standard? And because people wanted to have it. Smart cities, it's not about what is smart or not smart. In the end, is that the new norm from a competitive point of view is going to be between cities. It will be London versus Dubai versus Mumbai. It will be physical um, distribution centers competing for investors and business. And so you can reduce your operational costs by having one infrastructure and by, by taking costs out. Uh, but energy savings of 30%, and these are real numbers out of city plans. Water consumption down by 50%. Singapore is already water neutral. They call it from toilet to tap, and perhaps that's not the right way to call it. Uh, but th th it's water neutral. There is no absolute consumption. Crime rates down. Uh, there is an, a one-to-one -one correlation uh, between people being more happy. Crime rates go down. Traffic. And that all these small things, and that for, for US citizens uh, under us here, why should you go to the DMV to queue up for a new driving license? And you can take the, 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 the test online, you can have the form. And there are so many things that we do now out of routine, physically, that we could do virtually. On the other hand, and I want to come back to that, um, education um, via technology, via cloud-based curriculums, will be accessible for $3 per student per month. Healthcare, so is this a formula for developing countries? And will the cost come down that far that everybody will have the right to get education and healthcare? I'm, I'm somewhere halfway in my presentation. I want to have a checkpoint with you. What do you think? Who is cynical? I think, I don't know. Anybody dares to raise their hand? Who is skeptical? Skeptical, cynical, clear majority. We will have a discussion afterwards. Then, um, who is with me? Who is embracing these type of concepts? Excellent, thank you, majority. So how are we going to accelerate this? How are we going to do that? Um, I always you know that and this is my story, that, that my life. I was 12 years old when we got our black and white television at home. And I lived on a small island uh, for the coast of the Netherlands. 12 years, the first color television. If I tell my children, well, they, look at me. they don't even know what I talk about. And that I was 20 years old the first time I flew in my life. 20 years old. And, you know, I was 30 years old when I got my first cell phone. And you know, my son was 10 years old and he said, Dad, you know, I, I want to have a cell phone. And uh, then I said to him, son, I, I think you're a little bit too young for that. And then he had the deadly question. And he said, how old were you? And the discussion was over. But if I tell these stories that I had my first job in Italy working for Oliveri, if I wanted to phone home, I had to ask for a line. And it took, you know, two days to make a connection. And it, but, you know... If I tell these stories to my kids, they look at me as I look to my parents. Yeah, but so I can go on. I was 40 years old with my first VPN. I was 50 years old with my first telepresence at home. Um, but it's not about my age. And it, it, it's not the point I tried to make. The point I tried to make, and this is telepresence, these telepresence rooms, still relatively new. And that if I get customers in and they talk about the technology, if I have children in, like you see on this picture. You know what they do? They start playing, they start using it. And they don't think about all these barriers and they accept it. They use it to their benefit. 
Uh, this was in a, a picture when I lived in India, and I spent four years of my life there. And left top, you know, that's my son, that's Max. And he was the only kid in India with uh, yellow hair. <laughs> so very, very known. So if you think about uh, the technology, what it can enable, um, think about work. Look at, you know, young generation. They work totally different. They, they study different. They, they accept technology as a given. And they don't think in these barriers. We are often prisoners of our own experiences. And so my advice to you is that in your meetings, invite some kids. Let them talk. You know, they, 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 I met an Indian professor who said, you know, everybody older than 40 is not innovative anymore. And because we, we, we think, in, of course, we are the exceptions here. And because at, at, at every rule, you have an exception. And, but you, you get the point, you know, that look at your children, how they play, how they work, how they live, how they socialize. Although I don't accept that they text uh, on the dinner table to each other. And, you know these behaviors. But if you think about how work will change, and that, you know, cities in the past were built to go to your work. And that, 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 that was what you did. You went to your work. Nowadays, work comes to you. And that work follows you. Work will be virtualized. And mobility, and that makes you to be able to escape. You will see what we call spontaneous collaboration. And, and, and clusters of experts. And it, it's not that it's going to be this or that. It is this and that. And that we all have these physical places in cities where it happens. If you go to Paris and you go to Montmartre, and that's where it basically art developed. And that in, in, in Rome, and that, uh, it, it was all about uh, societies and culture. Uh, if you go to New Orleans, it was about music. And that every city has that, that hot place where it happens. And it will stay that way. But you now can also extend these hot places virtually. And you can cluster in expertise. And that you, you, you know, in, in a couple of years, you will get telepresence and video walls. And we always say that uh, let's discuss it close to the coffee machine. And we have these places in, in, in offices, or uh, you have these pubs or places or, uh, where you come together. Uh, but entire walls, you will then look at an, a coffee machine in New York, or in a coffee machine in Dubai, or a coffee machine in Mumbai, or Shanghai. And so you, you can easily mobilize a workforce. And that's so we don't go to work, work will come to you. And work will be virtualized. So don't commute to compute. I never go to the office to work. I only go to the office to meet people, and to have you know, sessions that you want to do physically. But if I want to compute, I can do it from any place in the world. So we could talk about it for hours, but, but work that will fundamentally change. It will be virtualized, and it, it will give a complete different acceptance. And so when I made my point that we have 200,000 shortage of, of nurses in the US, it are mostly females who don't have the time to certify or to recertify. If you can train them virtually, at home, in a community center. And you, you can match supply and demand much better. And so with that whole virtualization and these chains of demographics, except the chains of working behaviors. Smart working centers, a concept developed in Amsterdam, a congestion. And there was a visionary mayor who basically said, you know, I'm going to decentralize and we're going to create smart working centers. And that basically communities at the, where social, economic, and environmental drivers came together. And so it, it should always be close to a residential area, and decentralized from the center, close to a highway, public transportation, open meeting space, crashes, access to healthcare, and so complete different type of parameters to create a workplace. And this concept now goes global, and in Korea alone, and there's a plan for 450 smart working centers, and they're building it. It's a net saving of $1.3 billion. Imagine what you can do with that money, and, and how you can reinvest it in more innovative type of things. And it's a $1.1 billion reduction in carbon emission, because there's less traffic on the road. 
and uh, people share this. And so smart working centers is a concept that you start seeing flying. Let me now go to countries, developing countries. We have a lot of our African friends here and that who look at you know, how to get an economic activity going, how to create jobs. Because training, education and healthcare is one, but the next one is how to create jobs. And this is oftenly still proof of concepts. And my question to you is, and you know, I have some ideas, but how are we going to scale these proof of concepts? There are countries at the moment who say, please stop, not another proof of concept. Now, what is going to be the formula to scale it? And this is a village uh, that in my five, four years uh, of stay in India that we built. It's uh, in the north of Karnataka. It was an, a flooded place. Uh, people lost their home. You know, more than 100,000 people. And you don't see it even in a newspaper. And that, um, that uh, low education, illiterate, demographic, everybody of you know, 17 years and older would go to the city uh, to escape um, the misery. We rebuilt houses, and we connected schools virtually, and we have documented this, and, and we basically are following now that if broadband reaches a village, um, that you can have virtual education, you can have virtual healthcare, and what you see is that parents in the evening come in and to start looking at training courses, how to improve the crop and the agriculture. Also, that community starts arising, marketplaces, trading, it fights corruption because you, you eliminate all kinds of middlemen and it works. The question is, how are we going to scale these type of things? I think technology can play a key role there. Um, Jordan, healthcare initiative, and that also started with corporate social responsibility and we have an, an, a responsibility as enterprise company to get it started. But then we need all stakeholders to get it scaled. And so this is access to healthcare and specifically specialized healthcare. Um, knowledge Center in Sub-Saharan countries set it with Clinton Foundation, a $10 million project, investments in Cameroon, Ethiopia, uh, Kenya, and again, uh, you see economic cycles coming up. Education comes up, uh, jobs are being created, productivity goes up, and that people start becoming self-supporting and you see sustainable growth coming. However, it doesn't scale. And that, that in Cisco we run what we call the biggest virtual classroom in the world. And that, that it, it are our certification programs, the network academies, and that we, we improve employability. At this moment, every day in the world we have a million people connected following classes and courses. And 95% of people who certify find a job in three months and because it increases employability and it, it, it makes their life better, better jobs, better incomes. This is one of the few examples that, that where we are really getting scale now. As since conception, we have more than four million people trained. But I want to close and you know, have an interaction with you and a drink and, and, and start, you know, how can we accelerate? How can we scale? My two cents on the topic is we, we, we have to think as this as a new industry, the internet of everything. A couple of things coming together like cloud computing, virtualization, open data, apps. We need visionary leadership. And we need people and politicians, government leaders, and with that, that, that passion to make a difference. We need global open standards. And you know, ITU is playing a key role in that to help develop, to enable that. Energy management, I don't know. We haven't been able to standardize on the plug around the world yet. And then we have 220 and 120, we have 286 protocols, but perhaps we can have five standards. At least it's better. And the Netherlands is one of the first countries in the world that de deregulated energy consumption. And you can buy what you want. Finland has a plan to start trading um, energy via social networking. And that, that if, if, you, if you have a, a surplus, you can sell it to your friends and you can settle it yourself. You can pay in different ways. It's doable, but it, it needs smart regulation, also called policies. 
we have the right people in this audience at global open standards, the right policies. Amsterdam, um, San Francisco at this moment, and they have an eco map where they follow waste per zip code. And it was funny, you know, I had uh, Kevin Newsom, the former mayor, with me in, uh, at, a, at a press conference, and, uh, and we had a journalist who said, so, mayor, what is your zip code? And that was embarrassing. <laughs> it was one of the worst, you know, places. In, but the point I tried to make, and that it, my kids at home, you know kids, they never shut off the light. And when they go to school, the lights are on. So I have home automation and don't use it. And then, you know, we have a dashboard and, and they can see what they waste. Didn't work. Now I give them 50% of the saving as pocket money. And guess what? They switch it off. And so smart regulation and incentives and policies and how can you change behavior is going to be essential. Public-private partnerships around the conference, you've heard it over and over. And there are great examples of playbooks. And that if, if the mayor of, uh, of Chicago, and he said, we have fantastic all these smart city plans, but how will I be re-elected in four years? Great vision, but people will say, what have you implemented? So Chicago has now created a couple of funds at public-private, and, and things are starting to happen. And there are different ways of doing things. We need that visionary leadership. And last but not least, uh, we have to build new ecosystems. And we have to get industries connected that haven't been connected before. So from my side to you, question for action. I think ITU, public-private partnerships, academic worlds, and we're here all together. And I should like to invite you to talk about it and join us and get some further creativity. Thanks for your attendance. Thanks for listening. If you want, I could take some questions. Yes? OK. The minority wins. Can I, can I have an, uh, a mic for the gentleman over here? Yes. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jared Alfiel. I'm a financial journalist for Xinhua News Agency here in Dubai. Thank you very much for the presentation. Very interesting. Only one correction and one question. Um, you said that Germany was outsourcing manufacturing because of the aging society. However, I th they rather outsource because wages are higher. The wage costs are too high in Germany, so it's better to employ people in Asia or in Africa than an aged person. Actually, there are a lot of old people in, in Germany unemployed because they can't find jobs simply because the wages are too high and they're outsourced to other parts of the world. My question is, the two regions, Middle East and China are getting closer. Trade is growing at a double-digit rate per year. How do you, as Cisco Systems, benefit from these growing connections between the two regions? How can you benefit from this? You, you mentioned the connectivity within cities, within countries. I find it most interesting. But how can you, as Cisco, Cisco Systems, benefit from the closer relations between China and the Middle East? Thank you. Um. So first, uh, that, that, uh, correcting uh, my remark on Germany, and that I, I think Germany is one of the few countries who has been able, have, even with high wages, had to maintain manufacturing as a core expertise. Uh, but now due to an aging population, uh, there are not enough inflow uh, to keep the lines going. Um, that, that's one point, sorry. Uh, so how can the, you know, trade and um, accessibility of markets, I, I think is key. We always say in Cisco, we love competition. Uh, because if you have competition, customers will benefit from that. Uh, that with lower prices, uh, that with a, a bigger needs of innovation. Um, so uh, that open trade, I, I think, is always prosperity around the world. And uh, between what type of places that takes place, I don't care. Uh, that, but free trade, at this moment, uh, that in economic slowdown, uh, you always see a tendency for People call it indigenous innovation. I call it protectionism. And it never helps. It, it is always that free trade, global open standards will stimulate innovation and economic cycles. 
please. Hi, I'm Peter Bruck. I'm the chairman of the World Summit Award. Uh, we run within the World Summit on Information Society the global competition in 160 countries for best practice in content and creative use of ICT. I loved very much your presentation. I'm fully you. with you. I like very much the relationship which you established between a networked society and a more humane society and a more green society. However, I would make a distinction between something which is services and what is content. And the really interesting thing about content is that we have lived and evolved as a culture for 10,000 years without interactivity in terms of content when we use media. But we are about 20 years now into having networked interactive content. What's your vision for the role of content in terms of Cisco seeing you know, that path for the next five years? That's perhaps in a, a question over a drink, but um, I did, you can so, have that later on. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, uh, you know, and it's me uh, between now and drink. So let me. Um, uh, content, uh, like you said, is um, a treasure. Um, it, it oftenly is, you know, thousands of years of culture and history, like like languages. Um, and that's so I strongly, but that that's more a personal opinion than perhaps a company opinion, uh, is that. Um, and with technology that enables it, you, you can even easier sustain it. Um, so contact, services, um, I, I, I believe that a lot of context, content, content uh, can be made accessible and available. Um, if you take movie productions, uh, I love foreign movies. And that often, you know, that, that I don't have access. Um, there are a lot of treasures um, and that's maintained in ancient civilizations. Um, and that's, uh, I'm a European, I have the classic education, so I had to spend a lot of time on languages that I don't use, like Greek and Latin. But when I learned, in, when I lived in India, it's all about Sanskrit. And that it's the language of languages. So I think, you know, content in itself is a treasure and at, that, that we should be able to nurture and maintain. And um, services, is a monetization um, of big data and open data and even an, an, a further thrive of um, participation of democracy. And that all these type of examples I showed, and you start seeing that, that, that neighborhoods start budget planning in a participative way. And that is so from Big Brother watching you, uh, that citizen watching Big Brother. And that, to round it up, um, I, I agree with you that, that, that content and services are two different things. But a lot of content in form of data can be monetized via services. Let me close it off. I, I see that uh, the drinks are being served and ready. Thanks for your attention and I'm looking forward to mingle around. Thank you.